Welcome back to Misunderstood. I'm Rachel Yucatel. I think we can all agree that narcissism has become the most overused word in the English language right now. I don't even think the people using it really understand what it means. And if you don't understand, how could you possibly stay away from or be on the lookout for, or even know if you possess any of the qualities that make a narcissist? Today's guest, Richard Grannon, is the perfect person to help us understand what narcissism really is. Richard is a life coach who specializes in narcissistic abuse and how to heal from trauma. He has a way of explaining complicated behavioral issues in such an easily digestible way. I knew I had to have him on the show. Richard helps break down where narcissism can start and really gives tips on how not only to deal with, but how to move on and heal from this behavior. I've dealt with plenty of narcissists on my own and you know, being gaslit can make you feel crazy. And that's the purpose to make you question yourself. If you have ever felt this way, this is a must listen episode for you. Richard has over 600,000 subscribers on YouTube hanging on his every word. I think you will be as well. Sit back and enjoy my episode and conversation with Richard Grannon. Richard, thank you so much for joining me from the UK. That's so exciting. Thank you very much for having me on. Pleasure to be here. So your platform is all about helping others defend themselves and get back on their feet from narcissistic abuse. I just wanted to find out first how you got on this path. What was your personal journey to doing this? Um, well, I, um, <laughs> I, I, sort of came across it by by accident. The background that I had uh, was in behavioral psychology and in neurolinguistic programming, and we really didn't acknowledge personality disorders at all. So I do have some formal training in psychology, but nothing in personality disorders. It was considered esoteric and weird in the, the realm of psychoanalytic theory and, and Freud. Um, and I was teaching, I was actually teaching self-defense. Uh, I was running a, a popular self-defense channel on YouTube. And then I started getting messages from the coaches, a lot of whom were ex-military, who were having problems with the, uh, with the you would roughly say, were like people pleasers. They were being people pleasers in their relationships. They didn't want to see what they would call a shrink. They thought I was okay because I trained and I, and I boxed and stuff. So they're happy to talk to me. So we ended up talking about um, how to assert yourself and how to develop stronger boundaries. And you can't really push into that area without exploring and coming up against narcissism, narcissistic abuse. Finally, I, I caved to the, the requests from my client base who were like, you have to start talking about narcissism. And when I actually investigated it properly, I realized I'd actually experienced a lot of narcissistic abuse in my life. Mm. Um, so uh, some romantic relationships, uh, some family relationships, they actually were examples of narcissistic abuse. Right. So I feel like, you know, you hear all the time, oh, he's a narcissist. She's a narcissist. They're such an asshole. You know, I can't deal with them. I feel like it's become something that's used as like a hurtful term and, also, you know, and it's all these narcissists probably using it on other people. So I want to get to the heart of exactly, you know, how do you know that you or someone else is a narcissist? Can we go through the the symptoms? Yes. Um, it is an overused term now, a massively overused term, and it's 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 becoming um, a way of understanding reality, and it's like a filter for relationships. So people come to me and they'll be like, "I just need to know, am I the narcissist or is he the narcissist?" And I'm like, "Why have you framed the relationship that way? Somebody can be an asshole without having an, a, a strange and complex." Uh, a psychiatric condition it is possible right. and right. some relationships are not meant to be some combinations of people are genuinely toxic and there is the possibility of emotional abuse existing in a relationship without narcissistic personality disorder being present right for me to say that somebody had narcissistic personality disorder not narcissistic traits because they're two separate things okay. if they have narcissistic personality disorder they've experienced a very heavy level of abuse in childhood that uh, created a split in them between 
uh, good messaging and bad messaging. So they probably were the victims of abuse and or neglect at the same time as being told that they were wonderful and amazing for some performative action that they could engage in in the world. This then causes them, the adult that you have in front of you, to have uh, given up on reality and they've chosen delusion. So they've had a psychotic break with reality and they are now pathologically obsessed with a delusional version of themselves and a delusional story of their lives. Thankfully, that is still rare. That is still quite rare. And is it, I'm curious, is that something that's tangible that they see that this has happened and they're moving into, you know, they're splitting their personality kind of, or it's something that it it just happens? Um, I don't think there's, there's never really a, a conscious choice per se. It's mm-hmm. a way of coping with the, the trauma that they were raised in. So uh, the, the psychological term for this is splitting. So they're ra- they are raised in an environment where a lot of splitting is taking place. Maybe they have parents who are addicts or alcoholics or tyrannically religious. And so the world becomes split. The parents treat them in a split way. You are wonderful. It's a child. They're, they're good. You are awful. It's a child. They're okay. They're neither amazing and heavenly, nor are they awful and infernal. So they're receiving delusional feedback. And it's it's contradictory. So it splits the child's mind. The, the child's self-perception splits. And then in order to cope with that, they say, well, I'm going to live in one of these two fantasies. There's a fantasy in which I'm amazing and everything is wonderful about me. And there's a fantasy in which I'm awful and everything is awful about me. I'm going to choose the amazing one. But the, the, the dynamic that the narcissist lives inside of and treats the recipient, the, the partner, is one of a split where they're fighting to go to this false reality mm-hmm. to escape this false reality. Depending on where they are on the narcissism spectrum, uh, that they'll, some will cycle more than others. But right. everybody who's had an experience of a true NPD will will have a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde split personality type experience. Okay. And you said that that's more rare than having the actual traits, correct? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, I I differ from other people speaking in this field. Um, I've, I've heard people say that the, the rates of incidence of, of narcissistic personality disorder are now as high as 30%. If that were true, um, uh, our civilization would collapse. Mm. Um, I think it's still at the 4 to 5% that it's always been, but narcissistic traits on mass are on the increase so you can have an otherwise functional human being who's just very very high in trait narcissism and our culture actively encourages that we can't deny it and um, that is still a problem and it still makes them very difficult interpersonally but that is fixable with therapy that is fixable with an intervention narcissistic personality disorder is not Got it. Okay. So I want to talk about the, you, you talk about nine traits that people have and you can remember them with the code special me. Can you get into some of those, if not all, so that people can really tangibly understand what they are looking for in themselves or in others? So you've got, um, a sense of entitlement that they should be treated as, as different to other people. You've got interpersonally exploitative behaviors. Uh, they're bullying, they're envious, they are vengeful. They're heavily invested in an artificial uh, sense of self. They lie frequently because they're living inside of uh, a fantasy version of reality. And the experience of being around them is destructive. Now, the, that's, the last one is the tricky one inside of psychiatry because they haven't quite decided because all of this, I'm using the American system. I'm using the American Psychiatric Association Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. They don't seem to have made their minds up because they vote on these disorders via committee, whether it's adaptive or maladaptive. So in the Trump election, you had some psychiatrists saying that's narcissistic personality disorder. And then the guy who headed the committee for the DSM-5 said it's not because Trump is successful. And that means not to derail this into politics, but he's a good open example. And yeah, this no, a, he's a great example. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and it, it was a polemic that took place publicly with the American, that then started to involve the American Psychiatric Association, never in the history of psychiatry, had, had, had so many clinicians come together to say publicly, you shouldn't have that man in office because we think he's mentally ill. They're not supposed to do that. Right. Um, 
So they couldn't decide whether it was adaptive or maladaptive. And does it, so there's still an open-ended question. Do you, if, if I'm hurting you, but I don't hurt me, is that a personality disorder? Mm. Is it all right? So if I'm very successful and you suffer, but I'm fine, is that a personality disorder? And they, they haven't quite resolved that one. But roughly speaking, when you're looking at the nine traits, that's that's the type of thing people should be looking for. February is the month of love. And if you've listened to the podcast before, you know how in love I am with today's sponsor, One Skin. Most skincare routines only deliver superficial results, but with One Skin, you get a scientifically proven treatment that improves the appearance and health of your skin at the cellular level. What's their secret? One Skin's proprietary OS01 peptide. It's the first ingredient scientifically pr proven to reduce the buildup of cells that contribute to skin aging, which means with one skin, you are left with healthier, younger looking skin with fewer lines and wrinkles, reduced age spots, and a stronger natural barrier, which is especially important this time of year. Your skin does so much for you. Return the favor with one skin. Believe me, you will not be sorry. For a limited time, our listeners will get an exclusive 15% off their first one skin purchase using the code understood when you check out out at oneskin.co that's oneskin.co invest in health and longevity with your skin with one skin so i've been using this now for two months i'm not kidding when i tell you how many people have dm'd me that have used the code and that have gotten products saying that they absolutely love everything about it i love everything about it i now use the body lotion i use the eye cream i use the face cream i actually now use the tinted moisturizer for the sun i think it's spf 30 um i gave for christmas i actually gifted my 78 year old mother um uh, the product, it was the travel pouch and she uses all the product, even the face wash. I use the face wash too, actually. And she keeps asking how she can get more. <laughs> so, um, people are loving this. I I'm not kidding. When I say I get uh, an overwhelming amount of DMS on this product in particular, um, that people absolutely love it. You have to try it. You guys, one skin is more than skincare. It's about skin longevity, targeting the root causes of aging to help you look and feel your best at every age. Get started today with 15% off code using code understood at oneskin.co. That's 15% off oneskin.co, O-N-E-S-K-I-N dot C-O with code understood. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. It's time to expect more from your skincare routine. Invest in the health of your skin with one skin. Here's a hard truth. Four in 10 Americans struggle with obesity. You can do your best to stay healthy and eat well, but with all the exercise fads and health hacks out there, you don't necessarily know what works for you. And honestly, they're just not sustainable. I've gone through that where my weight has gone up and down and I don't know where to turn. But what if you could take a weekly shot to lose weight and keep it off? Let me introduce you to the Row Body Program. The Row Body Program provides access to the most popular weight loss shots on the market and paired with healthy lifestyle changes like diet and exercise modifications, you can lose 15 to 20% of your weight in a year on average, and actually keep it off. Are you ready to get started? Row Body Program supports you through the whole process. They pretty much hold your hand through every step from helping with insurance paperwork to on-demand questions. You can even sign up online. Before being prescribed medication, patients need to complete an online medical visit and lab test. Qualifications for medication are based on the patient's BMI, lab results, medical history, and the discretion of a Row-affiliated healthcare provider. The Row Body Program is ready and waiting for you to take the first step. Go to ro.co slash understood. That's row.co slash understood. Sign up today and you'll pay just $99 for your first month and $145 a month after that. Medication costs are separate. That's ro.co slash understood, row.co slash understood. Well, to get back on this Trump thing for one second, can you only say that it's a negative thing if it's considered a disorder as opposed to having traits? I mean, isn't it just as dangerous to possess these traits just because he's successful doesn't mean he won't hurt others per se, um, you know, being in office like you're talking about? I mean, I don't I don't want to stray into politics, but uh, when, when it when it came out in 2016, I was in a different perspective personally and my understanding of narcissism was different i think it is probably good and necessary for anybody who wants that role to have 
highly pronounced narcissistic traits. Even the uh, the grandiosity that is one of the nine traits of narcissism that defines narcissism. If you don't have a grandiose vision for your country, you don't have a narcissistic will to drive that forward. Do you belong in office? It's well, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. so. And also, if you're too empathetic, let's say you'll mm. fold at every turn. It, there's also something probably to be said about being harsh and only thinking of yourself and not spending any time thinking of the consequences for other others. There's, there's, there, there's something to be said for that in certain contexts, definitely. Right. Um, you don't want, you can't have, we'll stick with the president, but it could be any any political role anywhere in the world. But let's stick with the president of America because it's an easy one to wrap our heads around. It's, it's fre- so frequently portrayed in mainstream media and fiction. Mm-hmm. The last thing you would want in a country of 330 million people with so many different ethnicities and so many different perspectives and drives is indecisiveness. Mm-hmm. That's the, la- the, the the country would collapse. So you need a de- where does, where's that decisiveness going to come from? If not from a somewhat delusional adherence, grandiose adherence to a vision that is also somewhat entitled. Now you don't want that to become abuse. You don't want that to become well, we're going to abuse of the countries because we're the best in the world. Mm-hmm. But for a country to think that it's special and good is not, in my opinion, a bad thing. And for the leader of the country to think that it is special and good is not a bad thing. It's the, so when I enter this argument, if I was going to discuss it with clinicians, I'd be like, where's the line that we say, this is neurotic. Now you're hurting yourself. Now you're hurting your, your foreign policy is hurting your public image. Your your, your people hate you. So we've got we to gotta draw that line with a, a degree of nuance. Right, right. So, Let's stay away now from the disordered people and just stick with the traits because most people you're saying more people have that than the actual disorder. So can someone be born a narcissist or is this something that, I mean, you talked a little bit about it with the personality disorder, but their environment sort of creates them into this character, so to speak. I think, um, so, so in psychology, it's the it's the nature nurture debate, and it's gone on for decades now. Are you born this way? Are you entrained into this? And even that can become um, a, a political conversation. So 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 left leaning people would say it's trauma. Right leaning people would say you're born this way. Mm-hmm. However, we now live in the age of epigenetics, so we know full well that in in no instance is it purely one or the other. In the mm-hmm. age, if you unless you reject epigenetics and its claims, which is your environmental pressures are causing genes that otherwise would be dormant to start expressing themselves. So I was, I had some uh, genetic material that would lead me to psychopathy. Had I been raised in a lovely, sweet and quiet home, we would never have seen it. However, I was raised in a brutal environment with a drunk for a father and my mother's physically abusive and I have to join a gang by M12 or I'm going to get stabbed to death. Guess what? You know, that latent um, genetic material is is it, this is a really uh, geneticist be pulling their hair out right now because I'm coloring with crayons, but something <laughs> like this, some, some something like this is is, is happening. Um, so so we it, it's nobody can really say. All I know uh, that would be useful for you and useful to the viewers is from the data I from the research I've seen up until now, psychopathy seems to have a more genetic component than mm-hmm. narcissism. As the technology develops, which because it's still fairly new, we'll we'll know more in, in the next 50 years or so. Right. So it is a possibility that um, people become narcissists as a defense mechanism. I, I mean, the, the thing is with narcissism, the reason why I and others would push back on the genetic element is you, you th- there are specific substructures to the personality that really require that you learn that after you're born. It's mm. it's it has all of the hallmarks of a learned response. You need an audience. You need to learn that love is is adulation. Like like to a narcissist, genuine, vulnerable adult adult love is not only meaningless. It's somewhat horrifying. It's mm. like I love you because you're a person. I'm a person. Ugh, I don't I don't want your love. I want you to worship me. Or fear me, but I am above you. 
I'm always above you. If you come at me like this, ugh, I'm going to be disgusted. I'm going to be offended. And I'm going to hurt you for that. You need punishing because you you broke the system. That's that's learned. That that has to be learned. I don't I don't think there's anything in genetics that would cause a person to be born like that. With psychopathy, if you said there's less empathy, this person's sadistic, they're more prone to aggression, they have lower impulse control. Yes, and uh, we could selectively breed animals for that. It's been done. They've done it with mm. foxes in Russia, so we know that that's possible. The narcissism thing, I, I, I really, I really doubt it. That's and so interesting. Um, so narcissists are rigid in their point of views for the most part. Is it possible to get them to change their mind ever? I don't know. If you give me 20 of them, five years, a Guantanamo based style prison camp and you wave their human rights and I have an unending amount of psychedelic drugs to pump into them, maybe. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I don't. I mean, all I can say is like normal dialogue which is what talk therapy is. Talk therapy is is wonderful, but mm. and can work very well, but it requires two consenting adults with the same objective to be open and vulnerable and and that's not going to happen with a narcissist or somebody with NPD. So, I don't know how to do it because their whole personality structure is rooted in a stubborn, rigid denial of reality. Like the core of their being is no. Keep right. reality out. So you come along and you say, hey, have you thought maybe you could be less of a dick all the time? And their first response is just, no, I'm perfect. You have the problem. And if you say all of your family and friends think the same way, it's a really simple answer. They go, well, I'm perfect. So therefore, all of my family and friends are engaged in a conspiracy against me. And right. anybody who's been with a narcissist will recognize the, the tone and the style I've adopted for that. It, it feels the same. Yeah. So I think a big question for people that deal with narcissists is how can they change? How can I get them to change? Will they ever change? And, you know, they hang on to this hope that something will change. And I think that becomes um, almost the worst part of it. I've experienced it in, in relationships. I've experienced it with my own, one of my parents, um, which, which to me is almost worse because there's this feeling that, um, you know, my problem is that I constantly forgive and I constantly think, oh, well, this can't be how this is going to turn out. She will eventually, um, turn around and, and be nice or love me or whatever it is that you hope for. And I think, you know, I've watched some of your stuff and we'll get to that actually in a little bit, cause I want to talk about parental narcissism or whatever, but I think that in a lot of it, people stay because they hope that something's going to change. Yes. Um, so to answer the, the, the first question, mm -hmm. if they have narcissistic traits, they can, have an intervention, there can be feedback and they can change. Mm. If you're looking at narcissistic personality disorder, the best thing you could do for yourself is to give up hope, to cry, to grieve, to despair, deal with that, go to therapy. Don't expect them to go to therapy because there's no them there. If it's narcissistic personality disorder, the authentic human being locked itself away in a protective shell many years ago before they ever knew your name. And they, cho they oh, chose the wrong word, but, but they, they had to do that or they felt they had to do that in order to survive. It's, it's, it's over. They're gone. Um, many, many victims of narcissistic abuse can end up entrained into codependency through this hope, betrayal, hope, betrayal, hope, betrayal cycle. Yeah. And what they're hoping for is to see uh, the good split. So because the person is split and there's this wonderful, charming, fawning, seductive, kind side to them that wants to please you, that's what we hope for. And we hope the bad version of them never returns. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, sorry to say to the people who have been in these relationships, we start to go mad with them mm -hmm. because they're split. So we relate to them in a split way. We start splitting them and we start recording the good and the bad memories, I claim, separately. So we develop a kind of disassociative response to the trauma, which is why we forgive. Because you're not associating to all the bad things they did. You associate 
to the good things the good side of them pretends to do and you you leave the bad stuff in another place which which means that the the therapeutic hill to climb is quite long and quite steep in 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 truth Something you mentioned was that, you know, they have this charm to them. I personally know part of my, you know, bad picker is that I tend to pick people that are, um, that have these narcissistic traits. Um, Those people also tend to be very successful or be very charming or outgoing or have some sort of A-type personality. And to me, I find that attractive, but I keep picking people that also have that trait. What is it about um, us that picks these people or what is it about these people that, you know, they're so charming um, and so alluring to other people. Because you would think just, you know, and one, it would be obvious that people would, would want to stay away from somebody with those traits. Um, it isn't obvious to me uh, that people would want to stay away from people with those traits. I, I think that's something that we were all raised to think. Um, but if you challenge it, it, it isn't true. Um, don't you love the bad guy in some movies? Isn't isn't he kind of cooler than and funnier and more interesting? Like the good guy is just good. Duh. He's, I'm just good. Oh, good for you, Boy Scout. Why is the Joker killing people? Why is he called Hans Gruber, Alan Rickman in the 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 Bruce Willis movie Die Hard? Die that's hard. a fun, that's a charming evil. I want to I want to have dinner with him. I want to sit next to. The Boy Scout. What am I going to learn? No, no. It's I. I think uh, we have to be um, forgiving of ourselves and be like, well, what what's here? So uh, yes, confidence is 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 sexy, and there is a there's a gender split here. So for for women, women who are very um, sexually provocative, who are in the histrionic spectrum of the cluster B, who are going to use sex and use sexual attractiveness. I can't sit here and go, oh, I have no idea why I would find that attractive. Like, of, course, <laughs> of course. So there's there's a thing that I have to say to men, which is like, okay, recognize this in yourself. There are archetypes. There are stories. Um, think of the story of Salome in the Bible and, and the uh, you know, the, the 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 archetype of the Jezebel or, or or whatever. They have this in every culture. To women, I would say, let let's have some just honest debate. Isn't it hot? The bad guy's hot, right? Yeah, for sure. You, genetically, what are you looking for? You want strong DNA, you want decisiveness, you want confidence, you want some meek, like flat. Oh, I'm a good guy. Oh, yeah, it's great for you. What are we looking for? What are we looking for? And then how do we get some of what we're looking for and understand our own genetic drives? Because not everything that we're genetically adapted to means is is good. That's the nature fantasy. Just because your genes are saying, hey, get with this really hot sexually provocative girl or this really hot psychopathic, cold, and different but strong man means you should do it. We don't follow every genetic drive, but is there good there? What what are you going for? And to try and pass that, and then uh, you, you called it a picker, um, re, reprogram for that and go, no, I, I want that. That's hot because mm-hmm. if I want to stay with somebody for decades, I, I'm planning on having sex, so I would like sexual attraction to be there. These are the things I need. I think I think we can find a, a common ground. We don't want to engage in splitting. A lot of the victims of narcissistic abuse engage in splitting. You're either going to be with a hot, evil man or a not hot but good man. That, that, and that's 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 splitting. That, that that's not what the world that's that's not your only two options. Right, right. Um, what is the nice guy narcissist? That seems even more dangerous than a regular one. So the, the nice guy narcissist, um, as far as I know, that's that's not that's not proper. That's not proper research talk. I, th- I think um, I've said nice guy narcissist, but uh, somebody else said it before me. Mm-hmm. They definitely said it before me. Um, so there's a there's there's a pro-social narcissist, and then there's communal narcissists. So pro-social narcissists, they are um, charitable, kind. Um, they're not. It's not all front. Sometimes they're, they're re- some some are superficially kind. They'll run a charity, and then to, you know they'll be doing some completely evil at the same time. But many really are doing good work, mm-hmm. and there are historical figures that you can point to who really had a good impact in the world. 
but they were doing it for narcissistic supply. So their ability to build significance and to have an audience and to have adulation comes from their good deeds. So they genuinely do good deeds to get that narcissistic supply, uh, which is adjacent or not adjacent, but, but vectors in on the Venn diagram with communal narcissism, where they build communities to get their narcissistic supply. And in both cases, they can be very kind, very pro-social and, and really do good, but they're, they're, they're getting their um, trauma-based personality disordered needs met. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, we talked about this a little bit at the beginning, but what is the actual difference between a narcissist or somebody with those traits and someone who is just selfish or an asshole? And does it really matter that there's a difference? I mean, again, like we said, so many people going around labeling others as a narcissist, um, either to be hurtful or because it helps them sort of label what's going on with that other person that they can't deal with. Well, and the other thing, you know, just to put a footnote to what you've said there, I agree with what you said 100% footnote, um, it also absolves us of guilt. It also absolves us as like, oh, she's a narcissist. She's just an asshole. Okay, and what do you, what did you do? Nothing. I was perfect. I was the perfect boyfriend. Really? I don't need to go to therapy. I don't need to explore my shadow. I don't need to look at the fact that whatever, like we're human, we're fallible. You know, what was it about us coming together? You have two people coming together and then they create a third entity, which is the relationship. And it's unique. It's There's no combination of people that, that can create that third entity. But you two, mm-hmm. you two created this thing and this thing had an impact. What's that? Um, I think I think that's where people need to explore. And we need to be very careful of this uh, self self absolution that comes from condemning other people. And then you've got what? A witch hunt? What is this? McCarthyism again? Like this? It's no good. It's re- it's really no good. It is okay to say. Let's have a very easy um, yardstick. Mm-hmm. You don't like what's happening in a relationship. You presume the other person is an adult of good intent. If I tell you three times that it hurts me when you do a thing, by the time it's the third time you've done that thing. I have to question my assumptions about you as a human pe- uh, human being. Mm. Unless you are deep in alcohol or, or drug addiction or grieving or engaged or, or the world is collapsing, why are you continuing to do the thing that I told you really hurts me? It doesn't annoy me. It doesn't uh, inconvenience me. It really hurts me. You're still doing it? I don't care whether they're a borderline type two psychopath with three pinches of histrionic and one part narcissism, you should leave. Mm. You should leave because life is short. There's tons of humans around. Find someone else. Just right. find, find someone else. You don't need uh, the psychiatric diagnosis rubber stamp, which is totally questionable, by the way. It's not like narcissism is a settled subject in psychiatry. Far from it. The battle rages on. It's a very controversial diagnosis, very controversial. And it's ch- it's changing decade, not year on year, but decade by decade, it's changing. We don't need it. If somebody's consistently transgressing your boundaries, you can leave. And you don't need to say they're a narcissist or a psychopath. You just leave. Right. You don't need the label. Um, okay. So what happens for the people that are still in the mode of staying and they haven't chosen to leave yet? What happens when you confront a narcissist? What's going on in their mind? But also, is there a, co- a correct way to do it? I, I have no idea why anybody would want to confront somebody with narcissistic personality disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, you're facing a machine, uh, a machine that does what it does. It does it in, in, in many ways, uh, probably 80% blindly. Um, it's in a state of repetition compulsion. It's highly traumatized. And it's stuck on attack mode. We all have latent narcissism. We all have attack mode. This creature can't do anything else. So if you go, oh, let's go to therapy and be vulnerable and talk about how we really feel, you 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 may as well be saying, let's just take up juggling chainsaws and speaking ancient Greek this afternoon, babe. They can't do it. So what do they have? They have attack because all they're going to hear is, you're not as wonderful as you need to think you are in order to survive. And they experience this as a threat to their very survival. The core of their being is is to maintain this image. They'll just attack you. So it's like saying, what's a good way of standing in front of a moving freight train? 
there really isn't one. You can, you don't, I know why people ask this. They're being conscientious. They're like, I spent 15 years with John. And now this plonker with a weird accent from Britain is telling me I should just leave. No, I want to tell him. I want to talk to him. You, if it's NPD and you've done your research and you've developed the evidence to see that this really is NPD, you are absolved of the normal duties of dealing with another human being. You don't have to explain anything to them. Mm -hmm. You are better to go in survival mode. Do say anything to get out as safely as you can. If you need to lie, then lie. If you need to manipulate, then manipulate. Get out. Get away. Create distance. It's it's a toxic substance, and your exposure to it is slowly destroying you. I'm curious what your thoughts are on if somebody can show up with narcissistic traits to you, to your toxic relationship, but not show up for other people that way. Yes, it's it's actually quite common. It's actually quite common. So um, there are people with very, very deep wounds. Um, it's often related to, I know it's a trope, um, but it often really is related to childhood. Uh, an abusive mother, uh, a distant father or a father who abandoned the mother and the child maybe. Um, and so these are primary attachments. This is how the entity that we are, that human beings are, learns how to attach and to love. And if that's damaged, then yeah, um, you could be looking at somebody who is fairly, fairly functional at work, fairly functional with their friends. They go and play sport and they have their, their sort of, there's a few bumps. There's like, there's usually interpersonal turbulence because they don't, they don't interpret human behavior very well and they can respond. In, but generally speaking, they're okay. And then they're just a monster inside of the relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that, that that can happen for sure. And do you think that could be because you trigger something within them? So it's not with every relationship, it's just this blending of two people or it would always show up in every relationship because a relationship is so triggering? Something like that is happening. I should just say, if it's MPD, they're being MPD all the time. Yeah. But right. they're pulling it off. They're pulling off the front when they're not invested but something about the investment in the relationship, as you just said correctly, is a trigger. And, and then they're under threat. And then the narcissistic, uh, um, what is it called? You have narcissistic injury and the narcissistic rage. So then they start in, to interact in a very bullying and exploitative way. They're, they're always like that. It's just if you have maybe somebody who's kind of a pro-social or nice guy, nice girl narcissist, nobody else will see it. Um, only their partners will see it. But if that's the case, all their partners will see it. And if right. you speak or you can find out about what happened with their ex-partners or even talk to them, you'll see that they this is what they do. We, sadly, I'm going to say things that will hurt people's feelings now. I realized this with my ex. There's really no difference between me and the five guys before me. We were just... It's, you're just the man in her life. So for him, you're just the woman in his life right now. You're part of his story. You're a chapter in his book. That's it. And when you go, is he going to sit there and cry and think about you? Not, not the way you'll be thinking about him. He's not capable of that. They just move on. They just find another person. One person's as good as another in many ways. Right. Almost like a placeholder for the next. Yeah. 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 Um, let's talk about this parental relationship and the narcissistic abuse that can happen there. To me, that is worse because with relationships, they come and they go, you can get out of them. But with a parent, you can't, you always have them, whether, you know, unless you choose to cut them off and still that pain can be very debilitating for some. I've heard you talk a lot about this and I want people to hear your advice on how to move on from this or how to get out of this cycle with a parent. Yes. And, and you, you've told me this is something you're struggling with as well. Mm, yes. I, I mean, obviously, I'm 49 next week. I've struggled with it my whole life. But I've yeah. only started to realize that, you know, what what it was. Because as I said, for me, like, the hope is the thing that's been killing me, you know. And I constantly, you know, I swear I'll never speak to them that person again. And then next thing I know, I'm like, want to get some pizza. You know, it's like, it just is the worst. And I witnessed, you know, from my personal experience, I witnessed my parents fight terribly um, when I was younger, you know, before the age of five. And then in the next breath, they would kind of just make up 
And so I think I learned that kind of communication skill, but it's gotten worse. I mean, my father's no longer living. They were divorced when I was young, but with my mother, um, you know, it's, it's a very interesting dynamic because there are some days she could be so nice, but then when it comes down to it, um, it's a really terrible relationship that goes back way before I can even remember. And, um, you know, it's almost a sense that she really doesn't like me, you know, and people are always like, no, that's not true. That's not true. And, oh, just forgive her, just get over it. And it, those people do not understand when you have a narcissistic, um, abusive relationship with, a parent, you cannot just forgive them. You cannot just get over it. It's it's like deep within you. And um, those, those things never change. And for me, the problem was, you know, she would kind of provoke me silently, quietly. And then I would have this outburst and she'd be like, see, see what she, you're doing. No one, ha- you know, no one can believe you're acting this way, Rachel. How could you treat me this way? And it was really terrible. It makes me almost emotional thinking about it because it still happens. And I revert to being like a 14 year old child when I'm around her, but it's interesting with my daughter. She's very good. She's not that way. Yeah, it's it it it's a top one, and it's it's one. I'm in therapy. Um, are you in therapy? Yeah, I mean, I've been in therapy for many many decades over it, and have been you know the the best advice I sort of was given many years ago by Dr. Drew. I don't know if you're familiar with him, um, who's a friend of mine, and I've worked with. Um, you know, he really suggested I that I cut that person out. But that created all sorts of anger. And and the lesson he gave me with that is what as you heal, it really threatens that other person. Um, they don't want to see you getting better because then it takes the power away. And um, when I threatened to cut her off many years ago, it created an anger and a lot of threatening, um, you know, that that almost made it more dangerous. Um Yes, I I agree with with what he said to you. I just would add a layer to that. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I want to give you a quote from Nietzsche that um, I haven't spoken to my father in 18 years. Um, He's a very bad man. He ended up going to prison for what he did to his children. And obviously there was always a hope inside of me because there's different parts of you. So the little boy in me, of course, wants a father and a mother that to love him. And I acknowledge that. And I think that's good. I think that's healthy. I think, I think that's okay. So I start there when I'm talk, like dealing with myself. Nietzsche said, hope really is the worst of all things because it prolongs the suffering of man. In a situation where you are hoping and hoping and hoping for a different outcome, the torture never ends. The thing to do if you want the torture to end is to end it because we're not children anymore. Now, to add to what to, uh, Dr. Drew said to you, there's your mother out there. She's a real person, but you're not really fighting with her. You're dealing with the mother in here. You're dealing with the interjected mother. You said she became angry when I rejected her. She did. But the mother in here started to guilt trip you and shame you and make you feel like a very, very bad girl for abandoning her. Mm. Um, so in the end, what leads you back to the abusive relationship can often be feelings of guilt and feeling like you've almost abandoned a child, depending on the context of the relationship. Mm. So the real the real problem, the real enemy, isn't really out there. It's this interjected mother inside or father inside of us. What's the interjected mother going to say? If I say, no, I'm not going to talk to my... So all of us inside have here, we're going, I'm not going to talk to my real world mother anymore. And the interjected mother goes, oh, fucking really? Oh, fucking really? We'll see about that. Two months in, three months in, you'll find yourself in the into an abusive relationship with some psychopathic man. You'll find it, not you, but like people find themselves yeah. being tempted into alcohol, into drugs. And that's the mother interject going, if you defy me, I am going to hurt you. You are going to experience pain. So these are things that have to be pulled apart very, very carefully in therapy. And that's Mm. in order to really overcome this, we have to deal with that interjected part. Right. Um, Are female narcissists the same as male narcissists? Um, 
Well, I believe in biological determinism, and I think a woman is a woman is a man is a man. No, that's not what you're mm. asking. Me. <laughs> no, that's not what I was asking. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can cut that bit out. It'll give you unnecessary controversy. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Granham makes outrageous claim. Right. Uh, yeah. No. The the manifestation between male and female narcissism. Uh, to me is largely the same the the infrastructure is the same the manifestation uh internally is the same in the world of course we're going to use different strategies like if if you and i were in a race to i don't know overthrow a corporation the the modality that you're going to think to instantly is going to be different to me it's it's going to be like how how do you use what you have and what you've learned to get what you want. How am I going to use my life, my experience, my strengths, my weaknesses to get what I want? Of course, that, that's going to show up differently. So um, it's it's different externally. Internally, it's the same thing. It's the same it. thing. So it's significant, but not that significant. Right. Got it. Um, a lot of people describe codependence as someone who will stay with someone that they shouldn't, or they will enmesh themselves in a relationship like with a narcissist. Um, do you believe that? And what is the diagnosis or what is the real term for codependency if it's a real thing? Um, it's not a it's not a it's not a clinical diagnosis. Uh, there's, okay. there's something called dependent personality disorder. There's a real clinical diagnosis. Codependency is up for grabs. It's it's largely an American term. It comes from it grew out of Alcoholics Anonymous. What was it? It was first the um, the alcoholic, and then the person who is dependent upon the alcoholic. So it's the alcoholic co codependent to the alcoholic, mm-hmm. uh, or codependent to the addict, um, and that grew. In the late 70s, possibly early 80s, you can't really track it because they were, they were saying it, not writing it. It was written off, the first reference I can find is 1983, codependent. It is American. It is non-clinical. It comes from addiction and alcohol circles. Um, and then it was very popularized throughout the 80s by three women. I can't remember their names. They all wrote best-selling novels about women being stuck in relationships with abusive, psychopathic men. Mm. So we all had this kind of group understanding of codependency as being the person who enables, the person who stays, the the phone responder who can't say no, the people pleaser as the person who sticks around in a relationship. I've written a book called The Cult of One, and that I define my version of codependency, which I call echo codependency. And I try to present it as almost a mirror image of narcissism. I believe it was created in the same environment that creates narcissism. It's just a different response. One is a prey response. One is a predator response. Codependence is prey response. Uh, a narcissism is a predator response. But it's, it's, it's up for grabs. I use the term, but it's... It's kind of an umbrella term that's non-clinical. Right, right. Okay. The one big thing that um, when I mentioned I was having somebody come on to talk about narcissism, everyone wanted to talk about gaslighting. That is the biggest thing that goes with narcissistic abuse. Um, I want to talk about phrases of gaslighting. I've heard you talk about this. I think they're things that we've all heard before, but I think it's really important for you to go down and give some real examples of phrases so people really know what they're listening to. I've been in circumstances of gaslighting. I'm sure you have. Um, many people have. It is a terrible place to be in. You feel like you're going crazy. You feel alone. You feel like you cannot get through to this other person and you don't know why. Um, and it can make you crazy. So let's go through some phrases that people should look for when they are with, uh, when they are being, uh, gaslit. You, you've been gaslit. Did you say? Yes, I have. No, you haven't. You're doing it right now. (laughs) (laughs) First thing is gaslighting doesn't exist. (laughs) <laughs> I, actually, I actually had a th- I had a therapist say that to me. Uh, she said that she was a, an expert on narcissistic abuses in 2016. We got three sessions in and we started talking about narcissistic abuse. And she said to me at one point in the session, she was like, but you have to understand that narcissistic abuse doesn't exist. I was like, what? She said, narcissism is, is made up. And I was like, are you trying to drive me crazy? So, so gaslighting um, really is, uh, it comes from, there's two movies that were made three years apart. One was a British, one was a British-American version uh, called Gaslight. And uh, the chap is doing something that changes the gaslight uh, in the house to go up and down. And the woman can clearly see that he's doing that. 
and mm -hmm. says the, ga the gas lamps are going up and down. He says, no, they're not. No, they're not. And so that's gaslighting. So it's typically used to, in. it's like, it, they call it crazy making communication. It would be there to drive you crazy. You say you've been gaslit. And I go, no, you haven't. You go, yeah, I've definitely experienced gaslighting. Gaslighting doesn't exist. That's examples of gaslighting. You know full well that gaslighting exists. You know full well from your subjective experience that you've experienced it, but I deny your perception of reality. Now, when I deny your perception of reality in a calm and decisive way, the only thing a rational person can begin to do is to begin to question themselves and say, right experience gaslighting so it makes you doubt yourself and that's where you start to go crazy you're uh you lose your confidence in your ability to perceive reality clearly right so it's phrases that like you said make person make a person think that what they're saying is not accurate but then there are also phrases like you know this is exactly why you don't have any friends or this is why you know everyone fights with you that can be a version as well right uh, it would be it would be a way of um, so you've done your gaslighting and then you solidify it. You say, mm. you know, look, you know you're crazy. Come on, you know you forget stuff. Come on, everybody says that you make stuff up. Oh, right. Don't exaggerate. You're just like your mother. You're always exaggerating, just like her. This this that 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 would be a way of cementing. Uh, whatever gaslighting injunction went before. You say, I know I saw you kiss that girl last night. I didn't kiss her. I was talking to her and my lips hit hers. Right. God, you're so, why are you so wound up about sex all the time? It was an innocent, I spoke to her, my lips, see, this, right. this kind of thing. What, whatever, whatever you saw, you saw the person do it. I saw you do that. I have evidence. Now that's that's not evidence of what you think it is. Don't well, are you gonna trust trust me or trust your lying eyes? <laughs> wait, I have a very funny story. I'm not gonna use names, but I have a, a a male friend who was dating um a woman for like four years and he would always cheat on her and he um was never physically caught. And one night his girlfriend had stayed home and one of her friends was out at a bar and got a video of him making out with a girl in a dark bar and kind of rolling around on this like couch area with this woman sends it to the to the girlfriend and the girlfriend confronts the guy and the guy said that's not me what are you talking about i wasn't even there that guy looks like me maybe to the point where he would get, he was getting mad at her. How dare you accuse me of this? What are you doing that makes you jealous? Obviously you're cheating. Turn it around. <laughs> so like a couple of days later, I'm like, so what happened? Did you, are you broken up? He's like, no, she believed me. It wasn't me. And I, I mean, I'm friends with the guy. So I found the story funny, but it's a terrible story, right? That's outrageous. That's yeah. outrageous. That's that, that they're, they're not together story. anymore. And so, you know, obviously, but I thought I was like, that's gaslighting. And then he's like, no, it's not, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. Gaslighting right. is real. Right. Yeah, like the, that, I wasn't gaslighting. I was just lying. <laughs> well, it's 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 uh, uh, deny, attack, and then reverse victim, offender. Uh, Darvo, they call it. Deny, attack, reverse victim and offender. So the first thing you just say, that's not me. Then you attack the... But why are you videoing me? Why are you such a right. stalker? Why are your friends such psychos? That's not me. You're all psychos. There's something wrong with you. I told you there's something wrong with you. Um, victim offender would be that N now this is about you and right. what, a, what a paranoid weird person like who does this and if i can keep on the attack it's kind of like martial arts like boxing as long as yeah you've got a good shot there but if i can keep attacking you you can't do your good shots it's uh attack is the best form of defense and yeah sadly it does work because i think what you've got at the background of all this the elephant in the room to why everybody's complaining about narcissism is really, it's not a pandemic of narcissism. We're in a loneliness pandemic. Yeah. We're in a codependency pandemic. We're consuming way too much stuff that other people create for us. We're all engaged in way too much screen time, way too much ideology is being pumped in. And then we're very lonely. We're very alienated from each other. You meet a special person and you hold on to them. And at a point where you should say, I need to let this go and find someone else. You're like, no, but they're the one, they're special. And that's what keeps you, uh, you believe their lies. You you want to believe the lies, sadly. It's tragic, right. really. Because you'd rather do that than be alone. True. Yeah. Um, okay, last thing. How do we have a healthy relationship? What Can you give some advice on what people can do, can look for um, in a healthy relationship? 
yeah, sure. I'm 46 years old in two weeks' time, and I'm in a healthy relationship. Let me share my wisdom with you. Um, I'm probably <laughs> uh, I believe uh, if if you've got two people who are very, very traumatized, and the trauma is around love and attachment and stability, and they're raised in, in rough childhood environments, um, the big challenge, one of the biggest challenges that they'll face as an adult human being is intimate relationships. It'll be very, very difficult. I, I imagine, I've never lived it, but if you have two people who, well, if you've never experienced that and you're raised in a nice environment, you get another person who's raised in a nice environment, should be okay, should be should be all right. If you, if you haven't, you've got to go to therapy. You've got to look at this stuff. You've got to deal with it. And then you really need to know that that's something that you want to do with another person. You have to be willing to be self-sacrificing. You have to have really really very high levels of empathy you'll have to be very forgiving you're going to have to um be willing to be very vulnerable and very open because when we talk about relationships we just throw it away like oh i want to be in a relationship what kind long term well how long are you planning on living you're talking about decades of living in the same house with another human being right i say this in seminars to people like i want love i want a relationship and i'm like you want decades of living in a house with another human being and their eyes glaze over and I'm like, like what? what's the disconnect? You've got your fantasy, and then that's the reality. So instead of asking, how do I fulfill my wonderful fantasy? How do I live with a person? And how do I make myself livable with? Mm. That's probably going to get us closer to where we need to be. There can be no love without vulnerability. And there can be no vulnerability without safety. Make your partner feel safe. You want to make them jealous. You want to wind them up. You want to frighten them with other potential partners. Good luck. Good luck. You deserve to be single. You have to create safety because you're dealing with the most sensitive parts of the other human being. Yeah. And, uh, literally and figuratively. And I think what you said is important. People need to start thinking of how they, what they can do to make the relationship better as opposed to it's always about why that other person isn't living up to these, you know, standards that they've made up in their head anyway. Yeah. Um, and also I think in my opinion, it's important to learn how to really listen. And also, you know, you have to want to be known. You have to want someone to understand you and know you and be vulnerable, like you said. So mm -hmm. I think for me, those would be things that people have to remember, but what do I know? I'm again, 49 and single. So <laughs> has yet to be proven in my book. But all right, where can people um, find you? Where can they hear more um, about all these things that you talk about? I'm all over YouTube. I have five different channels on YouTube. I love YouTube. If you just put my name in, I'm active daily on Instagram as well. So that's probably awesome. the best. Stuff do, you, do you read your DMs? Can people DM you with a question? Um, no, but I go, I don't do DMs, but I go live uh, quite regularly, three or four times a week on Instagram. And you can ask me a question when I'm live. You can even come and talk to me. You can do a video chat with me. Um, or when I post a reel or a video, if you write a question underneath it, it's highly likely that I'll eventually see it. And are you still doing your seminars? Uh, I will be doing seminars. There's none, there's none booked as yet uh, this year. At some point this year, I will be in San Diego and Los Angeles. I don't okay. know when. Amazing. All right, everybody, make sure you check Richard out. His stuff is very interesting. I think everyone will have something to learn from that. Richard, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. Please be sure to subscribe to the show and give us a five-star rating and review. You can support the show by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. Do you have ideas for the show or want to reach out? Email us at info misunderstood podcast at gmail.com. That's spelled M-I-S-S -S, understood. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Misunderstood.